Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is my ever-expanding quarantine hair. And welcome to the 49th lecture of ECE 3084, Signals and Systems. This lecture will continue exploring some themes from the past couple of lectures where we looked at natural mappings between the S-plane and the Z-plane. In particular, this lecture picks up exactly where Lecture 47 left off. So if you haven't seen Lecture 47 yet, go watch that and then come back. So let's think about these relationships between the S variable and the Z variable. On the left, I'm going to draw a Laplace plane. So this is the real part of S, and this is the imaginary part of S. And on the right, I'm going to draw a z-plane, so here's the real part of z and the imaginary part of z. And the interesting places are going to be the imaginary axis for in the Laplace plane and the unit circle. This is not a great circle, but you get the idea in the z-plane. The imaginary axis in the Laplace plane plays a similar role to the unit circle on the z-plane, and they in fact map to each other under these rules. So I'm going to draw a horizontal line here, and then I'll put a dashed line in here. Now remember, omega s is 2 pi over ts, so omega s over 2 is pi over ts. And so now I can figure out how points from Laplace land go into z land by running through this formula. So let's think about what's happening for z. z is going to equal e, the real part of s, plus j times the imaginary part of s, all of this times capital TS. So let's focus for a second on the real part. This horizontal line has an imaginary part of j omega s divided by two, and down here it's at minus j omega s divided by two. So end to end, there's omega s worth of frequency space along this imaginary axis. So let's try to figure out what points map where. If the real part of s is bigger than zero, then I'll have e to some positive number, right? Something bigger than zero. So that will give me a number that's bigger than one. So everything on the right here is going to correspond to magnitudes on the z plane that are bigger than one that are out here. And that makes sense because if you remember, if we have poles on the right-hand side of the S-plane, those correspond to unstable systems. And equivalently, in the Z-plane, having poles outside the unit circle correspond to unstable systems. On the contrary, if we have the real part of S less than zero, I've got E to the something negative, then that's going to give me values less than one. And again, poles on the left-hand side correspond to stable systems. And you'll remember from 2026 that poles inside the unit circle corresponded to stable systems. And of course, anything landing on the imaginary axis or on the unit circle, those are marginally stable. So what about the imaginary axis? As I cruise along from the real axis up to this j omega s over 2, Remember, omega s over 2 is like pi over ts, and then I multiply that by ts, that will give me pi. So as I'm cruising up this direction, it's like moving counterclockwise in the z-plane, going from an angle of 0 up to an angle of pi. And if I cruise the other direction, it corresponds to going from an angle of 0 and then going clockwise up to minus pi which eventually, of course, equals pi. They come around and meet each other. So we can see where these things go. Out here on the right-hand side, what I'm drawing in purple here would correspond to being outside the unit circle in this first quadrant. And then if I keep going there, I wind up with these orange hash marks sitting here in the second quadrant. And then going the other direction, I'll put some yellow dots, and that corresponds to this section of the S-plane here. And for the remaining quadrant over here, how about a bunch of wavy lines? Okay, on the left-hand plane here, that corresponds to being inside the unit circle. So let me put some hash marks here, maybe going the other direction. So that corresponds to this part of the circle. 
And then if I keep going, let me use some wavy lines going the other direction. There's not really much logic to how I'm doing this. I just wanted to have another way to make a distinction between the various regions for folks who might have difficulties with making distinctions between different colors on their screen. How about this other slightly different shade of purple? I'll use some horizontal wavy lines here. And here's another variation of blue. Let me use some vertical wavy lines. This is either a highly artistic description of some junior level electrical engineering material, or it's a kindergartner's art project, or maybe it's a bit of each. Anyway, this shows what maps to what. Now, there's another problem that's hiding in here. Let me move this over to make some space. So I've tidied up my strange S-plane mosaic a little bit because we need to talk about the aliasing. Remember that along the imaginary axis, we drew something here that had an extent of omega s, and it aliases in that vertical dimension. There's copies of this structure every omega s. So let's select this mess and stick a copy up here. This isn't great, but you should get the idea. And we'll stick another copy down here. Uh, it's going off the edge of the screen a little bit, but you'll get the idea. So this is one of the main reasons we like to use the z-plane for discrete time systems, because we don't want to have to think about all these copies. If there are some poles here, well, there's an infinite number of poles either direction. There's one here, one here. There's also one here, one here, all the way up and down the line. Zeros, remember, we can put those wherever we want without messing with stability. Say there was a zero here and a zero here. Well, there's zeros everywhere here, too. And some pull over here is going to get copied here and here. So one nice thing about the z-plane is everything is unique. And now we can get into that realm of caution I told you about this logarithm of z. Think for a second about a pull sitting right here. That would map to a pull here. But there's a whole bunch of other poles that would do that. This pole would map here. And this pole would also map here. So if I look at this e to the s expression, that's not really a problem. Okay, I'll take some s wherever it is. It all maps to this spot in z. But what does this logarithm mean? I want to be able to give it a point on the z-plane and have it map back to a point on the s-plane. And there's an infinite number of points it could map back to. So this is where the question of mathematical convention comes in. Whenever we write something like log z, there's a phrase people will use, and that phrase is principal value. And what that indicates is that if we ask for the logarithm of z, we're going to give it a point in the s-plane that lies in the central strip. Not the one up here, nope, nope, nope. Not the one down here, nope, 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 or any of the others. Now, it's up to you to remember that when you ask MATLAB for the log of some complex number, it's giving you this principal value, and you need to remember there's actually an infinite number of other values it could have given you, and to think about that accordingly. There's one other little sticky point in here, and it has to do with the origin. If you think back to 2026, we often looked at FIR filters that had a bunch of poles at the origin, and that might have zeros flying around willy-nilly. So here's an example of an FIR filter with four poles at the origin and four zeros. There's not really a continuous time equivalent of this because there's no value of s that you could take this exponent to that would give you a z at the origin. If you ask something like MATLAB, what's the log of zero? They'll give you something like minus infinity, which makes sense. But basically, this little point down here is a place that's not accessible from the S-plane, according to this mapping.